The Bible is very clear. Your heart, my heart, is desperately wicked. But what's the remedy for it? In the Judeo-Christian faith, the only answer ever given that I think meets meaningfully is what Christ provided for you and for me in the cross. If you follow the Islamic faith and you ask a Muslim man, how do you attain paradise? He'll say, when you stand before Allah, your good deeds will have to outweigh your bad deeds. That's how you're going to make it. In fact, a few years ago, I was at Toowoomba at the University of South Queensland, and I was debating an atheist and an Islamic scholar. He said that right from the platform when I put him the question. How do you attain paradise? Your good deeds will have to outweigh your bad deeds. You ask anybody from the pantheistic worldview, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and so on, every birth is a rebirth, every life pays for the previous life. When you finally attain that karmic victory of attaining perfection and paying for everyone, uh, every previous birth, then you attain nirvana or moksha, whatever it is. In other words, you're paying all the way through. You incur a debt with each birth, and you pay for that debt with each rebirth. Look at the story of the prodigal son. This boy goes to his father and is basically telling him, I'm going to treat you as though you're already dead. I want my inheritance now. I don't want to wait till you die. And the father gives him his inheritance, and the boy takes off, squanders it, plunders his own life, finds himself in literally a pigsty out there. And he says, you know, my father's servants are living better than I am. I wonder what he thought. I'd love to go back. I wonder what my dad will do with me. I'll tell you what my dad would have done with me. <laughs> it's true. My dad was from Kerala. He spoke Malayalam. My mother was from Chennai. She spoke Tamil. I was raised in Delhi, so I was raised speaking Hindi. I speak Hindi and I speak Tamil. I'm very comfortable in Hindi, quite comfortable understanding Tamil. The only words I know in Malayalam are words of scolding. <laughs> what my dad gave me. And I, I won't repeat them for you. You see... In the culture of India, the father as a patriarch held quite supreme. In many parts of India today, you will still see when the sons or daughters or daughters in law walk in the room, they touch the feet of the dad, first thing. It's a culture that's gone that way for, for centuries. This boy is taking his dad's money, blown it, and he's going to come back. Would you have ever imagined in an Eastern narrative that the father rushes out of the home to meet him halfway? Totally catching the whole narrative and the listeners off guard. And he comes and wraps his arms around him and said, this my son was dead, is alive, is lost, and is now found. Put on the robe, put on the sandals, put on the ring, let's celebrate. You see, the older brother couldn't handle that because grace misunderstood will always lead to jealousy. And the marvelous thing about the Christian worldview is you can never earn the right to really be embraced by God. It is his gift to you. It is the provision on the cross. And so you're waiting till you're all right and all cleaned up. You're coming the wrong way. You come as dirty as you are. He's the only one who can clean you up. You know, I was, uh, I was telling the folks at uh, Perth yesterday, not at Perth, at uh, Adelaide yesterday, the time I was in Jerusalem, part of a small delegation with the Archbishop of Canterbury, the former Archbishop George Carey. He'd taken the five of us to discuss um, mediation approaches with the Jewish leaders, Palestinian leaders, especially the religious leaders. And on the last day, we are with one of the four founders of Hamas. His name was Sheikh Talal. Sheikh Talal is a pretty solidly built guy. Spent 18 years in prison. Lost several of his children in suicide bombings. We'd spent about three some hours there, had a long discussion. He gave us a great lunch, and now the intensity begins in the dialogue, you know, and he's just clenching his fists, and he, we're just sitting back and listening to all the venom and all the anger. And as it's coming to an end, the Archbishop looks at the five of us and says, if you men want to ask him one question each, keep it brief, and then we'll move on from here. So my turn came, I looked at him, I asked Sheikh Talal a question, I won't tell you what question I asked. But he gave me the answer and I looked at him, I said, you know, Sheikh, you and I may never see each other again, but I really don't like your answer. I said, I have to tell you that. And I said, I'll tell you why. I said, we're sitting here in Ramallah. I said, not far from here is a mountain. Not far from here. 
5,000 years ago, a man you and I respect by the name of Abraham took his son up that mountain to offer his son as a sacrifice for God to demonstrate his faith. Do you remember the story? He said, yes. I said, let's not discuss which son it was. Let's just agree it was his son. He said, yes. I said, and as the ax is about to come down, God stops the arm of Abraham. You remember that story? He said, yes. I said, what did God say? He couldn't remember. I said, God said, stop. I myself will provide. He said, that's right. I said, shake stone's throw from where you and I are sitting is a hill. It's called Calvary. I said, 2,000 years ago, God kept that promise and took his own son up that hill. I said, shake the lel. This time, the ax did not stop. God himself provided. He's just staring at me. I said, I want to say to you this, sir. Until you and I receive the son God has provided, we'll be offering our own sons and daughters on the battlefields of this world for position, land, power, and prestige.